Around 1300, after nearly two centuries of wandering, the Mexica people came to the Valley of Mexico, a valley long dominated by the Toltec. The Mexica, with no Toltec blood, were seen by the refined city-states as violent barbarians, a threat to the stability of the valley. The local states attacked the nomad nation, killing many and driving the survivors to a rocky area covered with cactus and infested with snakes. The exile was meant to destroy them, but the Mexica were used to adversity. They flourished. Soon their resilience and skills in warfare impressed their sophisticated neighbors. They began to sell their services as mercenaries, and within a generation, the Mexica were accepted as part of the social and political fabric of the lush mountain valley. In 1325, they asked the neighboring lord of Colhuacan to send his daughter to become the wife of a Mexica ruler. Flattered and seeing the opportunity for unity, the lord of Colhuacan complied. Days later, when he and the other lords of the valley went to the Mexica town to honor the new princess, instead of seeing his young child emerge, a priest appeared, dressed in her skin. Horrified, the lord of Colhuacan called for revenge. Here! Come here, my vassals from Colhuacan. Come avenge the hideous crime committed by these Mexica. Let them die. Destroy them, such depraved men of evil. My vassals, we shall finish them off and leave no trace or memory of them. Colhuacan and its allies attacked the Mexica, driving those they did not kill into a lake in the center of the valley. Almost annihilated, the Mexica again proved resilient. As they gathered on a swampy island in the lake, they saw an eagle perch on a cactus. The prophetic sign they were told they would see when they reached the end of their long search for a homeland. The place that would be called Tenochtitlan. Now we have found the land promised to us. We have found peace for the weary Mexican people. Now we want for nothing. Be comforted, children, brothers and sisters, because we have obtained the promise of our God. For 100 years, the people of Tenochtitlan built up the island through great sacrifice. They reclaimed land from the swampy lake and erected stone temples, public buildings. Causeways of hewn stone were constructed to the north, south, and west. An aqueduct was built to bring in fresh water from a mainland spring three miles away. Canals were dug throughout the island to transport goods and people. They gained trade wealth and again hired themselves out as mercenary soldiers for the powerful city-states of the valley. Marriages were arranged that finally brought them honored Toltec bloodlines. Tenochtitlan was a city on the rise. The cycle of power was turning toward the Mexica. And when war again broke out in the valley, the Mexica and their allies prevailed. In victory, they called themselves the Aztec, after the Mexica place of origin, Aztlan, land of the herons. From this point, Aztec prophecy foretold a glorious future. The might of our powerful arms and the spirit of our hearts shall be felt. 
With them we will conquer all nations near and far, rule over all villages and cities from sea to sea, become lords of gold and silver, jewels and precious stones, feathers and tributes, and we shall become lords over them and their lands, and over their sons and their daughters, who will serve us as our subjects. For over 80 years, the Aztec launched far-reaching campaigns of conquest, expanding their domain from Gulf to Pacific. They fought epic battles with city-states throughout the region. Most were conquered and turned into tributaries, forced to supply slave laborers for Aztec public works and pay high taxes in goods. Aztec scribes recorded the taxes of many states. Bolts of fine cloth, Discs of hammered gold, exotic plants and feathers, precious stones, feathered military uniforms. Built on the backs of the tributary states, the island capital of the Aztec grew into one of the wonders of the world. When I first opened my eyes in this world, I was born of this heritage. I have seen the beautiful festivals we have in our villages, our dances, and it would have been like that there. They had many festivals in this place, with many beautiful dancers, wearing many brilliant colors. I think it was even more beautiful then, much more beautiful when our grandfathers lived there and followed their ways. The two-story houses of the elite were adorned with beautiful gardens. Royal aviaries housed thousands of rare birds and storehouses swelled with the wealth of empire. The city was cleaned daily by thousands of sweepers, its refuse collected and shipped away on barges. The central markets thronged with professional traders whose travels took them to far distant locations. Men who spoke many languages and often carried with them news of the world. The center of Tenochtitlan was dominated by the great temple, its twin pyramids representing deities who embodied the conflict at the heart of Aztec society, the eternal struggle between life and death, fertility and war. Their private rituals, which on special occasions included the sacrifice of human prisoners, incorporated this duality. Life required death to exist, and death required life. Tenochtitlan became a city of hundreds of thousands, a bustling metropolis ruled by the Aztec emperor from the Grand Imperial Palace. But in the year one read, the Christian year 1519, Motecuzoma could feel a shadow across his empire, and he could not forget that the prophecy of Aztec greatness had a dark side, a prophecy long held in their oral tradition. I shall make war against all provinces and cities, towns and settlements, and make all of them my subjects, my servants. But just as I will subjugate them, so too will they be snatched from me and turned against me by strangers who will drive me out of this land.